Standing here right now, I can't help but reflect on just the amazing things that God does to bring you to places. For the reasons that you thought you went to a place <laughs> and how he ends up revealing to you what he's doing. I remember when Pastor Upton had first spoken a word of faith or even a prophecy over me about my future when I had everything in my life laid out to go to music school when University of Miami offered me a full ride scholarship and then God tells me not to go but it was based off of a word that Pastor Upton planted in me by the Spirit of God and ever since he spoke those words over me that I think God has more in store for you than just being a popular, famous jazz musician or something. And then now falling in love with the word that he's spoken over my life. Because now I can't see my life being self-centered to where I'm the one who's glorified. Not that God has a problem with you succeeding in any area, but it's another level when God can trust you to trust you with other people. You know, in all humility, I know that the reason why God brought me here is because God wants to do great things with my life. That's the only way. <laughs> that's the only way he can give me a leader like Pastor Upton and the amazing elders who pour into my life on a daily basis, who call and check up. I'm just in awe of God just the things that he does <laughs> i literally remember when god gave me dreams of this moment happening and i couldn't understand it i literally had dreams of being in a room where i took off the bass <laughs> and to me it, it was in the middle of worship and as a musician it's like when do you walk away like that's that's wrong <laughs> you know um I'm just so grateful for the people God has given me. I'm just so grateful. So, I want to talk about some things that God has put on my heart today. You can take your seats. The first thing I want to talk about is the fact that I can speak for me, and I know that this will resonate with some of you. It's that at the first moments that we start walking with God in our infancy stages, God puts us in a position to where we're, we only have one choice to make. It's just show up and receive. And that's not a bad place to be. It's just it is wise to know where you're at. And... As you mature, he starts to present you with other choices. And once he gives you those other choices, it's like the trust between you and God starts to build. And I can't help but remember when I would only play bass. And some of you guys might not even know what that means, when I would only be a musician here. And then as, times, uh, as time progressed, I started to get tossed little assignments by Lady Bree. Lady Bree would send me like two songs she's fighting with, uh, picking for this week. And she would be like, hey, Jermaine, what, what do you think? And questions like that started, they started, they make you think because you can't, you can't just lean on someone else. You have to look inside of yourself like, oh, I prefer this. And then, Walking with God, you find out that he trusts you with another level of authority where he trusts you to fill in the blanks. Where no one has me on training wheels. My dad isn't helping me ride the bike anymore. 
I'm just free whenever I want to get on the bike and go ride wherever I want to go. Because there's a level of trust and then there's also a level of maturity in myself. So with this being said, I want to take us to a familiar place in scripture. It's going to be John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and I'm going to be starting from verse 3. We're going to play a little bit of hopscotch with this scripture, but um, we're going somewhere. So I'm going to start at verse 3. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him, him being Jesus, a woman caught in adultery, And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Remember that spot. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. And this is where we'll be at for now. So I want to present to you the title of my message today, which is Filling in the Blanks. And and (laughs) with filling in the blanks, I'll give you the key right here and we'll find it in the text. Giving grace is the mind of Christ. And you can, all, God is calling us to a place where we fill in the blanks, but he wants to be able to trust us to have the consciousness that comes from him. Pretty much the foundation that we're standing on to know that the things that come to mind or the responses that, yeah, I can't say things that come to mind because there's a lot of things that come to my mind that shouldn't come out of my mouth. But God wants us to be in a place where we are, we're able to make decisions with his heart being a part of us and not, not a face that we put on just for a certain circumstance. So filling in the, filling in the blanks with the mind of Christ. Once again, giving grace is the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is wrapped up in giving grace when life gives you blanks to fill. So the question is, there's a question. The question is, how do we fill in the blanks that life throws at us? And what is a blank? And a blank is a moment where life begs a response. One where you can't, you can't, You can't fake it through. You have to actually respond based off of what is inside. We know this because of Miami traffic, you know. (laughs) And I want to take us back to the text by looking at this. Here we see after the, the scribes and Pharisees brought the woman to Jesus, we see that after they said, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded at us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This is the first blank that we see in this in this specific text. And right here is the opportunity to insert grace, but in not in the way that you think. <sighs> I'm so grateful for good leaders who give you perspectives when looking at the word. So... <laughs> The first blank that you see and the first the first response that you see with this blank that they presented to Jesus is that if we know that we're supposed to fill in the blanks with the mind of Christ and giving grace is the mind of Christ, where's the grace in this text? We notice that right after we read verse, we read this verse after they say, but what do you say? They said this, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. 
right there, grace just happened. But not to someone else, to yourself. The ability to give yourself grace when you're presented with a scenario where you feel like you have to respond or even people are demanding a response from you, you don't have to respond. You know, this isn't it. This is not in my notes, but it's so crazy that one of the when Jesus summed up the commands, we see that Jesus says, love your neighbor, but not in and of itself as you love yourself. How can you give what you don't have? You can't give to someone what you don't even give yourself. So it's crazy how we see this here. <laughs> and uh, after literally him giving grace to himself. And my favorite part of this reality is the fact that Jesus is Jesus. <laughs> like, it's like if anyone doesn't need some grace because he's perfect, he is God he is grace, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's it's just so amazing to see that Jesus or even times in scriptures, we see that he can literally read people's thoughts. He would reply to what someone was thinking about. And it's like, but yet he takes a moment to think for himself to respond. That lets you know. This lets you know that. It's OK to take some time to respond to certain things. So some examples in now daily life of filling in blanks. These blank examples are like disciplining kids. Even, even if you're one of the harshest parents and don't, kids don't look at your parents right now. If you have the harshest parents, even they don't even discipline every time you mess up, at least not at the same level, because there's a measure of grace that you just know that you're supposed to give. And this is fingerprints in the mind of Christ. Mael doesn't get disciplined. Fivefold ministry. Fivefold ministry. And uh, she doesn't get fivefold ministry after every time she doesn't listen. It's, it's a process. It's a buildup. It's, I'll talk, I'm okay with talking to you three times in a row. But after that, there's a limit. And then after that, then mom comes and saves her. But... Ah, other other moments are responding in like Miami traffic, where your someone just cut you off. Someone didn't someone didn't leave the traffic light according to your schedule because you were running late, and we know you're running late. That's why you're mad. So we know that. In moments like this, you're presented with a space where it's okay to give yourself grace. And even for some of us, we should even give grace to grace in the sense of giving yourself time to respond. Even if you feel like you know the answer, you give yourself some room to actually receive a download of a different response. Or just a moment to think so that way you can respond differently than before. And with all of this mind of Christ and responding and filling in the blanks with the mind of Christ and giving grace is the mind of Christ. This reminds me of the reality of being a musician. The worship leaders today and all of us today, like we rehearse a set thing. You can say we rehearse the song from beginning to end. But by the time we get up here to minister, the song sounds almost nothing. Well, we have the format the same, but we end up going in places and we start flowing in a certain place. But that flowing is an example of the mind of Christ. It's not a random thing that we're doing. Even though we might not know where the singer is going, we know that we, we know that musically, as long as everyone is in the same key, we can only go so far off on the deep end. If we're in the key of C, <laughs> if we're in the key of C, we know that if we're worshiping in this key, Torrance is not going to start playing bells and whistles in F sharp. It just sounds wrong. Like, it's, it's just not going to work. So 
God is calling us to a place where we have a conscience of grace. And I want to bring us back to the text for another moment. From So after Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, I'm in verse seven. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And notice this point right here that the moment that Jesus responded, what he did, he didn't attack them. He presented an opportunity for them to look inside of themselves. And there's a key right there. Even though you might not be a scribe and Pharisee who was accusing Jesus, the opportunity right here is the fact that If you know you're someone who struggles with seeing people from a place of grace or answering problems from a other perspective where you feel like, uh, you know, might be like, oh, you that's being too nice and people will step on you. One of the keys is to look internally whenever you have an issue on being able to be graceful to someone, even people who don't deserve it. All you have to do is look inside at a time where you remember where you were 100% wrong. And remember a time actually that you were even punished. But you were punished after the fact where you in yourself, there's times that you'll get in trouble for something, but you were already sorry in yourself, but you were disciplined anyways because there's still consequences to action. But when you look inside of yourself, you end up finding that when you look inside of when, when you look inside of yourself, you end up finding that it's easy to give grace when we are when you reflect on moments where you know that you wish that I wish I didn't get as tr- in trouble as bad as I did before. You know, like, it's always easier whenever you try, instead of, if you're not at the level where you can put yourself in the shoes of the person who, who needs the grace or uh, the situation, it's always better to look at it in that way. So I also want to take us to another place and in, in the text, and I'm almost done. It's my first time. I do not want to be up here long. (laughs) So we have here, we're going to play some hopscotch again. We're going to skip down to verse 10. Actually, let's read this part because this is important. So from verse 8 and on, we have, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those... Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And something just to remember in this text is that a few verses up, we see that the scribes and Pharisees were talking about the law and its requirements, saying that the law of Moses said that a person caught in this act should have been stoned. But That's not even what happened because the one person who actually legally had the right before God to stone this woman, he chose a different response, which lets you know, of course, Christ has the mind of Christ. But you we know that his mind, how he sees things, even when pushed against a corner, he looks for opportunities. And even if there is no opportunity, he makes one to insert grace. I just, to me, these are the points in scripture where it it still baffles me that 
but we serve a God who we literally were just singing a holy, holy, like, you know, there's no one like you, Lord. There's no one like you, Lord. And there truly isn't, but not in the way of you're so powerful and strong. One of my favorite attributes of God is how big and strong he is, how powerful we see him. But yet every opportunity we see him showering himself with grace. And even if you're one of those people who are like, oh, this must be a New Testament thing. You end up looking back when at Mount Sinai, you have, uh, I'm not sure if it was Mount Sinai, but God ends up letting his glory pass by Moses. And the things that he speaks, like, you know, like when God let his glory pass, the things that God said when he was speaking for himself, when everyone's seeing this big, scary God who's who'll judge you. That's all they talk about when we relate to the Old Testament. Not at, not at the Refuge Church, though. Not at the right. <laughs> because Pastor Upton is deep. So, but notice how when he speaks of himself, he says, I'm full of compassion. I'm slow to anger, full of mercy. Those are the things in scripture. So it's, these are the things that like, let me know personally when I read scripture that the Lord Jesus truly is God because of these attributes and i want to take us to one more one more nugget if you if you forget everything that i've said giving grace is the mind of christ and the mind of christ is wrapped up in giving grace when life gives you blanks to fill and Even if you forget all of that, just something to to look internally and just to understand this, because sometimes we can slip up in this when walking with God, especially when we're doing good. Your flaws will not stop God. Look at Jesus being unmoved by the woman caught in adultery. Like, like, let's not let's talk about the fact that he wasn't even commenting. The only thing he said after he finished flooding her with grace, he literally saved the woman's life. He literally saved the woman's life. And then when he had the opportunity to be the one person who had the right to stone her, he chose not to. Your flaws doesn't stop God from pouring into you. And the moment we walk into that reality where we know that Not This is not a license for sin, but just a reality to know that you're not, your problems aren't big enough. Your sin habits or even the places where you fall short, where you're at the place, let's say you're at a more mature place where you're not just doing blatant sin that's specifically in a commandment not to do. When you're at the place where you're deciding between better and best, and someone has to lose on time. There's even people who I know who are here today who sacrificed. And sometimes other people pay the consequences and there's always a cost to decisions that you make. Just to know that whatever you thought was a mistake, if I had a nickel for the whole process it took me to get here, I literally... (laughs) I'll tell this story because I might not... (laughs) It's so funny, but most people, you know, when they're going to another job or another opportunity, you technically give a two weeks notice, right? No, not at the Refuge Church. Pastor Upton, sorry, I have to call you out. Pastor Upton told me when things, because when I first started coming here, it first started with me just coming to Bible study. And then I would help out in Bible study and you know, give my time. And then we would invite some musician friends and we would help out with Bible study and things of that nature. But things progressed through the years. And he was like, yeah, so uh, yeah, this is getting too much. So you start here in two weeks. And I'm like, I have never seen a new job tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm firing you from the last place that you're at because you need to be here. best decision ever, literally. (laughs) 
your flaws, once again, will not stop God. And even if it isn't flaws, it's just what you see as flaws. One of the most powerful things in closing is that the way that we see ourselves can not only stop ourselves, but more importantly, stop the people God has called us to bless. And I love this because I get to be a part of the worship team. I have been here for probably more than eight years. I don't know how the math works, but all these wonderful, amazing singers, these worship leaders, these spiritual giants who's, who come here and minister in consistency. When you come to the Refuge Church, you know praise and worship is just going to be fire every time. <laughs> But capture this, the reality that if you knew the conversations and the way that they saw themselves before they got to the point, back when they were just background singers, when they would fight, even Lady Bree, would fight to lead a song, but yet now you get to walk closer with God, you get to walk in sense and, and experience the tangible presence of God when he enters the room because of them actually serving and pouring. But it takes you, it takes listening to wise counsel because sometimes people around us that God has sent us and given us see more in us than we see in ourselves. And this is one of, <laughs> in real closing now, in real closing. <laughs> In real closing, just one last thing. <laughs> no, that's a trap. I refuse to be the stereotype. <laughs> five more minutes, five more minutes. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but I just find it amazing that... Uh, the people who he sends us are the ones who end up seeing more in us than we see in ourselves. So if you forget everything I say, remember that your flaws will not stop God. It is our benefit, of course, to grow in maturity because if God can use you in your brokenness, how much more could he use you in your wholeness? But this starts with a repentant heart. And that repentant heart is a heart that, and understand repenting is not exactly changing your actions. Repenting is actually changing your thinking concerning a thing. So when you go back to that thing, you can't help but, ah, I'm now aware of what I'm doing. So, so even if you try to do it, it's like you might fall into it, but it's actually a fall or it now becomes a struggle. Before it used to be like, oh, oh, it's, I'm just, sin is winning. <laughs> I jumped in the pool, right, Deke? <laughs> Deke put me, pushed me in the pool on re, in rehearsal last week. And I had to do it. I had to do it. I allowed him to and he did warn me. So I had, I was, I was prepared. I had shorts. <laughs> so. All of that to say that in the title that filling in the blanks with the mind of Christ and giving grace is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is wrapped up in giving grace when life gives you blanks to fill. Even if those blanks and those grace spots, you have to start with yourself. And it's okay, even if it's an entire season where the person you're giving grace to, the person you're giving self-care to is you. Because if you don't take that time and build yourself up, you won't have anything to pour into anyone else. And God wants us to pour from a cup that is full. Mm -hmm.